Hello and welcome to another episode of Electric Sheep. My name is Paul Andrews and I'm joined in the studio by Carl Sykes. Hello again everyone. Lindsay Muir. Hello. And Anne Smith. Hello. Uh, the theme of today's podcast is going to be about how people can use technology to enhance the research process and make research that little bit easier. So uh, we'll be talking to Anne a little bit later on about how she uses um, technology to enhance the research process to make her day job a little bit easier. But before we get into that, we'll kind of go around and talk about what we've each been doing this week. So, um, Carl, how's your week been? What have you been up to? Well, this week I've been working with um, our new blended learning uh, energy management work-based learning team. Um, they're a new new program here at the university, and um, essentially they, they want to try and make their, their courses blended um, as possible. So I've spent a bit of time with them working on their use of the virtual learning environment that we use here at, at Newport, um, and, but specifically looking at alternatives to the way they present their information to their students. So this week, um, on their request, we've sat down and, and done some work with Prezi, which which essentially is an alternative to uh, PowerPoint, the presentation tool, um, and I think we touched on it ever so slightly in the, in the in the previous program. Yep. Um, but essentially, what it does is it allows you to be more um, uh, interactive and intuitive and, and and interesting with your PowerPoint presentations. Um, it allows you to embed videos, audio files, pictures. Um, it lets you fly around the screen from step to step, and essentially. You know, when you're sat in an audience watching PowerPoint presentation after PowerPoint presentation, I think it kind of breaks up the boredom of the same old, same old. So it's a really useful tool. They really enjoyed it and got a lot out of it, out of using um, Prezi, um, and, and are very keen to carry on working with, with ourselves within the team to kind of help advance their, their, their learning skills. So, so hopefully this will be an ongoing project working with them, and um, you know, in the future we'll have lots more opportunities to get some more training under our belts. That sounds really good. So um, just for those... Folks who are listening who aren't aware of what blended learning is, what's what's that all about? Well, well, essentially, what what this what this particular team wants to do is they want to they do want students to come in on the odd occasion mm-hmm. and, and actually have sort of face to face lectures or seminars, whatever it may be. But they want to give students the alternative and the opportunity to, to kind of work from home and access documentation, um, access their recorded lectures, whatever it might be. So essentially, give them a, rather than rather than a totally physical presence or um, you know your kind of traditional come to university and sit in a lecture hall, um, but also it's not completely online and distance learning it's kind of a somewhere in between where all of these elements are blended together into a nice um, um, nice package so So people can mix them like they can mix and match it's like i can go to the lecture and i can access some stuff that complements the lecture yeah absolutely yeah Yeah, absolutely i think the way it's it's hoped this is going to work is there will be lectures to start off with physical lectures but then they're going to kind of distance themselves away from that a little bit and make it more of an online presence and more of an online interactive activity so that um you know, because the people who are doing this course predominantly are going to be in employment anyway. It's very difficult to take time off work when you're in full-time employment. Um, so, so it'll give them an opportunity to get a bit of time off to get themselves I- integrated into the course. But then they can kind of move away from that physical side of things and actually um, start to do more of their work online via the processes that we'll make available to them. Wow, cool. So, uh, so when do you say when it's launching? Have they got uh, like a time frame? For um, the it? hope is, as far as I'm aware, the hope is that it's going to launch before Christmas 2012. Um, that's the Brilliant. hope. So very, very soon. So indeed. if you're listening to this, because we're planning to launch after Christmas, yeah, absolutely. it should be live. Yeah, it should pretty much be yeah. live and ready to go. So, so, you know, it's worth keeping an eye out for. It looks a really interesting course. So Fantastic. Yeah. I mean, and the other thing, I mean, I know we mentioned it in the last podcast, where to go with the podcast, we're going to have a, a website. So we'll put links to everything we mentioned today. We're going to put links up. So um, if, well, if the course is already live by the time we push this out, we'll actually put a link to any supporting material we can do if you are interested. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, and it's, it's, it is a great course, um, but it's useful just to have a look and see what they're doing. And, uh, you know, if, if it's suitable for you, then, then certainly, you know, get in touch with the guys. They'll be more than happy to hear from you. Brilliant. That's fantastic. OK, I'm going to hand over to Lindsay now. Lindsay, uh, do you want to introduce yourself first of all and tell you, because obviously that last week we had Elizabeth in. Elizabeth's not here this week, so Lindsay has, has kind of boldly stepped forward and said, right, I'll, I'll step in and do the podcast. Um, what do you do within the team, within our little Seadell team, and what have you been doing this week? Uh, okay, so yes, I'm Lindsay Muir, and I am the, well, I'm part learning technologist, part curriculum developer. Mm-hmm. So I develop courses for uh, people, staff, students, um, where there's a gap, then I might write something 
that's suitable for them. Uh, this week, I have been working on a website for the Heads of the Valley, the HOVEP project. Mm -hmm. um, they came to us hoping to build um, an online environment for educators to get together and share ideas, good practice, um, documents, links, perhaps get into social bookmarking, share interest in websites among themselves. Um, so that's what we've been doing this week. Well, I've been doing is um, working on this website, which actually we handed over to them today. Brilliant. So that should be live by the time this <laughs> Indeed, goes out yes, after Christmas. Right. So um, for those people that don't know what kind of Heads of the Valleys and Hove app is, um, how would you describe it? Is it a collection of schools that are within a certain... Yes, it's, it's, it's a particular area. It's um, Blyna Gwent County Council and Merthyr Tydfil County Council. Okay, that's in South Wales if you're listening overseas. Yes, <laughs> yes, yep. And um, there's a number of colleges involved. There's Merthyr College, College Gwent, um, the University of Glamorgan, Brilliant. AS. Uh, several people in partnership who are working together to try and upskill people in the Heads of the Valleys area, basically. Oh, fantastic. Uh, so the website, hopefully, will be a portal for people to meet and um, discuss anything to do with education in the Heads of oh. the Valleys area. So um, it, it, are they are they looking to try and build it, almost like a community uh, of practice, or is it... Yeah, yeah. I'd say that's, yeah. that's their goal, yeah, is to build a community of practice, um, to get people to set up a blog, basically, mm -hmm. um, and, and comment or contribute to this one blog where they can all share ideas, um, interesting facts... Brilliant. So if you, um, with, with the blogs then, are they, so they're looking for people to blog some stuff on, on their own blogs and have this feed into the community that they're, they're building? Yes. Yeah, so the idea is um, that you, you can either set up your own blog yeah. um, and feed everything that you post in that yeah, blog wonderful. to their website, or there is a label called Hovep Chat that you can use to just send particular posts, or if you want to just contribute to their private blog, if you're not so confident with blogging, um, you could have a little practice in that area first before you venture into the, the big wide world of blogging. Wow, that's really good. And um, let's say someone's listened to this and think, I, I'd like to get involved. You know, we'll, we'll put the link up on the website. Yep. Um, do you have to be in, in the kind of the, the South Wales area to submit your blog to have it no. be part of? So they'll, they'll, if you want to get involved, you can do no matter where you are. You can get involved no matter where you are. I mean, it is aimed at educators in, in the Heads of the Valleys mm -hmm. area. But it's open to, they've even said pupils can get involved. Basically, wow. anyone involved in education okay. anywhere can get involved. Yeah. That's fantastic. So what did you use to, I mean, you say you know, you've, you've built the website. What did you, what okay, did you use? Um, the platform that we used um, is, is, is a Google tool, basically, called mm -hmm. Google Sites, mm -hmm. um, which allows you to build a website for free. It's really user-friendly, easy to set up and then maintain. Brilliant. Um, and so part of the process was to train uh, the people at HoveUp to, to manage the website after. Um, but, yeah, it's a really, really cool package. And, and is, it, is it free? Can anyone yeah, get involved? It's, yeah, it's completely free. Um, you just need to sign up to Google. Brilliant. Um, and then once you've signed up to Google, there's a whole suite of tools that's available to you. Really cool stuff there. So we were able we were able to build in um, a built-in registration form that feeds straight into Google for them. Mm -hmm. um, we were able to build in a calendar of events um, that people can um, add their events to as well. Yeah, basically Google Google Sites is really, really cool. Really easy to set up and then really easy for people, user-friendly for people to manage after. Wow. So, so so if anyone wanted to build their own website for anything at all, they can just go onto Google Sites and set one up and they're, they're good to go? Yeah. And do they need to be, like, coding experts? Do they need to... Or is, it, is it easy to no. use? No. It... There's no coding involved because mm -hmm. um, I'm not a coder myself, as you know. <laughs> It's basically the interface is just set up as if you're writing something in Word or cool. adding an image into Word. It's it's done in that way, so you don't have to be a, a web designer yeah, um, and able to to be able to build it. That's what's so cool about it. Really, really, it's opening that up to everybody who isn't, you know, a HTML coder. And do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, explain what you do in the team to everyone and. Uh, uh, my name is Anne Smith. I've been in Newport University since 2009. I'm a senior researcher. Mm -hmm. Initially, I was applying for a lot of grants yep. to, for ideas on myself or ideas from staff in Newport. Um, done quite a few small little projects. For example, we should work with the government, 
created a, a clean 3D world clean. Cool. Um, at the moment, I'm in, in Cedar with these wonderful people around me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm there to provide support and workshop for all the staff and students in Newport University. Wow. I provide, for example, expertise on research, data management, statistics, anything which involves the data itself. Excellent. So, do you, I mean, you get a lot of the same kind of questions. Do so students come up to you the same kind of staff, same kind of things? So it's quite varied. What kind it, of... it is varied. Um, recently, a lot of people want to be interested in SPSS. Yes. And that is a, a, a statistics package which allows you to collect data, store it, mm -hmm. which is basically the same thing, and then analyze it using a lot of packages within SPSS. Right, right. And even staff who have never, who has very little experience in into it want, want to learn and apparently maybe students right okay so it's, it's at the moment it's, it's quite popular yeah so they so they, they they'll collect the data from somewhere they put it into spss uh and then do they just kind of click buttons and it runs statistical tests for them or no, no not that far some then haven't got a clue how to open spss right okay so, so, so you're dialing it right back into yeah. so so it would be fair to say you're kind of supporting people who are um not so confident with technology, mm -hmm. right the way through to people who are confident with technology yes. but perhaps aren't familiar with that particular yes. package or maybe even to use that particular package in a particular way. Yes. Do you get a lot of people who, I mean, for, the, for those of you that um, don't know, the, the, when people are doing research, they basically have to um, state a hypothesis and say, I think this is true, or, you know, I think this is going to be true or not. They then have to collect data and run a certain types of statistical mm -hmm. tests. And the choice of test which people have to run will, will vary, won't it, depending yes. on the kind of hypothesis they've made or the... Or the data they have, or what questions. You have to ask questions of your data. Yeah. Depending how you ask the questions, what methods you use. Right. And, and you, do you find that, is that part of your role? Do you have to kind of um, not only show people that kind of, this is what button you click on, but actually say, well, before we get into that, what kind of test are you going to run? It's quite hard place. to do that without you looking at the data yeah. more clearly. So you, you have to pick their brains about. You have to ask them questions. What What do you want from this data? How do you collect this data? And from that, then you can use the different methods. But a, a lot of it, and one, one thing about SPSS is actually putting the data in. It's, it's, like, it's like a spreadsheet. If you mm -hmm. get that wrong, everything else is totally wrong. Yeah. So that's so so important to tell them. You have to do that exactly right. Otherwise. The output would be totally wrong. Gotcha. And they don't understand that. They just put it in anyhow, thinking, well, it do, but it doesn't work like that. Cool. So, and um, the people I had doing this is from the studies and from research as mm -hmm. well. So it's both people who are undergraduates who need that for part of the, you know, course. Yeah, gotcha. So you're um, supporting the whole kind of range of and, undergraduates, and postgraduates. And also with people who, um, like the technicians who use these SPSS for students. So right. I'm helping people who teach students or support students as well. Oh, so like train the trainer events yes. sort of things. Oh, brilliant. That's fantastic. Um, so, I mean, you mentioned, uh, so you've been here since 2009. You mentioned um, you, you built a 3D Kalean. Mm -hmm. I was intrigued as to kind of the reasons why this is why you're asked to do this. But also I wanted to know, and I, I don't genuinely don't know the answer, but I wanted to know, is there some relation to the research side of things that you do tied into this? Or was this a separate project altogether? It, it, so... was, it was a project. And apparently I'm planning on both. I'm the first one who did it. Wow. Yeah. Impressive stuff. Yeah. Uh, it was it was from the People's Collection, which was was was, was, was funded by the Welsh government. And they wanted to develop what the fortress McLean, what it would look like when it when it's at its prime. Oh right. What the the, 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 uh, the Roman Yeah, Roman fortress. Right, yeah. So for those of you who don't know Killian very well, it basically used to have a a Roman encampment here. We've got like a lots of kind of archaeological ruins. There's a the Welsh Roman Museum mm -hmm. is in Killian mm -hmm. as well. So there's there's lots of kind of history and heritage. Yeah. So they want me to do that. And a lot of the data they had, they didn't have a clue what it was. Right. We so what what do we have to we have to guess? But we had to talk to people from Newport and people in museums and how they foresee, for example, the barracks. And um, in those days, the bar they had no toilets in the barracks, inside the barracks. They had to go outside to go to the toilet. Those kind of things. And um, believe it or not, there's more than one fortress in Killian. No right. Because outside was, was loads and loads of houses and not house, but huts mm -hmm. in that time as well. So, you, so, so, I, I mean, I'm imagining something like Time Team, uh, but I, I'm guessing with less digging and more kind of computery stuff. Yeah. Was it? So, 
was the end result like a, a model which people could look at or could they walk through it or uh, what was the how was it made yeah what what was what, what was the outcome? so, so, was so the what we did we did it in google sketchup oh right yep. it's free so mm-hmm. which is wonderful and what we had to do and what they wanted to do is actually create these objects so the barracks they want exact size of course you couldn't do that size <laughs> yeah but you have but... to scale it exactly mm-hmm. where it would look like the texture mapping was essential and it took a very long time, very yeah, long to I, do that. Yeah, can imagine. And then you have lots of ex, you know, lots of tools you can export it. Mm-hmm. And to export it on the web, we export to VRML, okay. which allows you to view this 3D model interactively mm-hmm. on the web. And also, we wanted it to be embedded in the web page, so we add Flash to it as well. Gotcha. So, and is it is it live at the moment? Is it is it something? Is this something people can access if they want to, like now? Can yes, they, it is. It is fantastic. Yes, it is. Mm. You, and you can roam through the streets. Oh, so imagine you were walking in the, back then. You can walk through the buildings. Wonderful. So it's, mm. it's quite impressive. I'd like to see that. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> cool. so, so that's one of the projects I did. Mm-hmm. Um, other projects was not connected to Newport, but just used more of a climate change and everything else. But the workshop here in Newport has been really good because you have to encourage staff to do research. Yeah. And it's very, very difficult. It's very da- daunting. Do you agree from YouTube mm-hmm. point of view? Yeah, it's really absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So you know, from my personal point of view, for someone who kind of has, has dabbled very, very slightly in researchy type stuff and not really done a huge amount at all, um, it is scary. And if, if you're faced with it for the first time and you don't know where to start, it, it can be a fairly daunting um, prospect. So it's it's great to have somebody that, you know, has, has a good knowledge of this area that you can fall back on and say, right, well, look, I need pointing in the right direction. How do I get up to speed? And can you, can you make sure I'm I'm doing the stuff I should be doing in and doing it correctly. So yeah, it's, it's always the initial stage. It's, it's getting that idea in your head, and yeah. people say, "How do you get that idea in your head?" So what we go do is, is look what you're into, or what you're interested in. For example, if you're into technology, or the war in your case, car, Second World War. Yes, right, <laughs> it's a yes. massive war, but this car. So anything like that, you got to find an interest and have a passion into mm-hmm. it. And then what you do then, you got to start looking what what has, has Bay Austin in that area. That's when you start doing the literary review of mm-hmm. it. So what you do, you have to look through books and journals yep. and all, all that so you can see what's been done. And um, when you when you start reading these these journals and books and the else, you can find this grey area, something that which has been done but needs improving one way or another. Right. And that's where the research comes in. That's where your research will be, is looking for the grey areas. Gotcha. And it can be as simple as just, if it's writing software, which is my background, it's just to improve the software. Simple as that. It could be simple as that. Mm. Or using a different methodology to describe something. So that's how you do it. Do you find that, I mean, obviously, uh, we've got, Undergraduate students might not have been exposed to that before, so you know they have to be shown or you know guided through that me- methodology. Um, do you find that uh, there are lots of staff who perhaps they're they're, they're classed as academics, but because we've got certainly in this university and, and in the sector, there's now so many different ways in which people can become lecturers. You've got the traditional routes, you know, you do your degree and your masters, your PhD and that kind of stuff. So you might have been exposed to that research methodology previously but do you find that there are lots of other folks that have maybe come in via different angles maybe via professional route or via the more kind of teacher education route that need help and support and guidance because it's unfamiliar to them yes yes mm. it is because even when you're looking at the literature view we just get scared yeah. where do i start and it is quite daunting to be honest to you you know you have to be very organised and, you know, to use lots of services on that's available. For, for example, Evernote, that's a wonderful tool to use. Mm-hmm. Really wonderful. That makes life a lot easier. You're just able to organise all your findings and your data and everything else. So there's a lot of tools that can help you. Even um, the Google Reader, that's another wonderful tool. Excellent. So you can use to help you search all that data. Okay. But yes, it's, it's very daunting. And it's, they just need a helping hand. So you want someone to help a hand and say, this is where you, you need to go. And then, and then after that, they're quite fine to do it by themselves. Mm. But they, they need to. Because if you haven't got a research background, even a master's, I know you do some research, but it's, it's not a lot, is it? Mm. So even then, you still need that, that guidance from someone yeah. who has done it. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. So, I mean, so you, you've built a Roman, you've built a Roman <laughs> fortress in three dimensions. <laughs> yeah. You're helping people with SPSS and the research process. What have you been doing this particular week? Has anything kind of stood out for you as a, as um, a highlight or...? Well, I've been preparing a um, workshop on data visualisation Fantastic, yeah. Which, which is my strong point, mm-hmm. my background. 
Um, there's so much tools out there, and that is online once again. Okay. What What do we mean when we say data visualization? And again, if anyone's listening, thinking, what What's that? What What is data visualization? It's a way to visualize data rather than using text or or writing a paragraph mm -hmm. or essay to describe your data. You use more the visual aspects. So like, like turning it into charts, pictures and stuff. Yes. Right. Okay. Gotcha. Or or um, like a chart, um, like like a heat map, for example. Yeah. that Shows you color. Will highlight areas which is important, which is not. Mm -hmm. And you've got, you've got the pie chart, which everybody uses, you've got the bar chart, but that's quite boring these days. Mm. Now you can use software, writing code, to actually do, allow you to do that. Cool. So, uh, and again, are the workshops going to be focused on this is how you create the, the, the particular visualization, or is there an element of this is the visualization you should use in this given scenario, and then this is how you create it? It's more just general. Right, okay. Because it depends what background you come from what techniques you will use. It's, okay. it's more general. So, I mean, so you do the data visualization this week. If someone comes to one of these data visualization sessions, um, what do you what do you show them? What do you say to them? So they come to you with, I assume, either some data or maybe an idea in their head. Do you send them away with a specific set of instructions that they need to go and follow, or do you give them a specific tool that they need to learn how to use? Or I, I give them more of a hindsight what they could use. Right. Okay. So you're making you you're kind of saying here's a menu, yes. and these are the links you can access these Wonderful. tools, and these are the examples what people are using right, with these okay. tools. Right. Okay. So so I'm not, I'm not telling them that they have to use that because sure. they can't. Okay. Because I'm not their expertise in their background. Gotcha. But but I can say that you can use this this model or this package because it will create this and this and this. Right, right. And I give them the links and examples of okay. that. And is there um is there a favourite one? I mean, is there one that kind of comes out to be people? They, like, they always like the gaming because everyone loves right. the gaming. Right. Okay. Always the three D part. Always because okay. it's visual. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I know certainly it's something that a lot of staff here at the university want to make use of, and I just wondered if you could just very briefly say how you use Evernote to help your research, mm -hmm. or how someone who's looking to, to kind of start doing some research area, whether their staff or students could use Evernote to kind of um, collate information together or whatever it might be. It, it's just it's, it's a tool which is free. You can just register and, and you have Evernote. So you don't have to pay anything. That's one good thing about it. Um, when you're doing research, you have so, so much data, so, so much you collect on your way. And Evernote is just a wonderful way of, of doing that. You can use your, your mobile phone. That's another thing you, tool you can use. So when you, and you can also, when you surf in the web, it, it will save the web links. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, if you want to take any pictures when you're doing research, your phone will automatically upload those images into Evernote. And uh, it just saves so, so much time. Mm. It's pretty good. And I, and I think I think last week people got across the, the, the point that we're all for free. No, it's, <laughs> you know, if, yeah. if, if it's free, it's, you know, we're very happy to <laughs> sort of have a go and use it. So, yeah, absolutely. That's a real key selling point for us. So. That's it's, it's like the Google Reader. Mm. It's free. So why not use it? You know? yeah. So what's Google? I mean, again, if people are listening and they're kind of like, OK, well, that's Evernote. You mentioned Google Reader. What, I mean, how would you explain to someone that doesn't, know what Google Reader is, never heard of it before. What, it, it, why would they want to be? It, it, it? it saves time. Mm -hmm. Basically, you know, one of the good advantages of research is it takes ages to go through all the literature review. Right. What Google Reader can do for you is if you tell it to do everything on, for example, gaming. Okay. And you, it will search the web for you and give you all the links on gaming. Without you telling it to do that, it will store it for you in okay. Google Reader. So you, when you do have time, you can go through the links and saying, yes, this is good, this is bad, and that's the case. That's, that's one. Right. So, so you can basically say, look, I'm looking for this, and it will then run off and find yeah. that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and then does it just kind of sit there till, does it sit there until you then go back and look at it? Yeah. Uh, okay. And then, and then, so once you've looked at it, what would happen? Let's say, you know, I'm, I'm doing some research into whatever it might be, and I said to Google Reader, I want you to go and find me this information, and, I, and it comes back and it gives me the information. What do I? What would I do with it then? Would I take the information and put it into Evernote? Would yeah, I? You could. Put it, what or could... you can send it to friends. Right. Okay. So that's no good tool for it. So if someone else, if you do, when you do research. Uh, if you post doc, there's usually quite a few in one room, so you can tell, you can you can see something interesting. You can send it to your supervisor because that's essential when you're doing PhD mm -hmm. or doing research, or you can do other researchers. I found this great 
paper or article, have a look at this. Wonderful. And you can send it to them. So it can be all collaborative yeah, and Yeah, that's, that's essential. You yeah. know, that's essential. In research, one of the important things is to talk to everybody else. Mm. To express your ideas. If you get stuck, you, you talk to people and say, this is my research. You know, what do you think of this? Mm. So I mean, it sounds like there's a lot, there's... It sounds like you've got like there's a research methodology, but then you've got at the, at these various points. You've got technologies which people can use yeah. if they want to. It's not you have to, but if you want to, that will help them achieve certain things. We've got uh, Google Reader for for finding information, making that a little bit easier. Mm-hmm. You've got Evernote for making notes and storing all your stuff. We've got SPSS for doing kind of data analysis. <laughs> Is there anything? Um, I'm just trying to join the dots up here. What about the data collection aspect of it? So I've 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 done my, my lit review. Uh, I've I've got all, I've read lots of articles and journals and stuff. Um, Google Reader's got all the stuff for me. I've made my notes in Evernote. Mm-hmm. I want to get to the point where I can use SPSS or some other data mm-hmm. visualization tool. Is there anything that could help me go from I finished my literature review to you can um, research question to you can create like questionnaires mm-hmm. in, in the Google. Google Docs. Google Docs, I said. Yep, okay. <laughs> I knew it was something like that. So you can, you can create questionnaires from, from Google Docs, and it's free. I like mm-hmm. the word free. All right, so, well, I think... Sorry, can I interject? No, yeah, can, go um, teaching the students this in some of the modules I teach on, um, the beauty of Google Forms, which allows you to collect the data, mm-hmm. is that the students aren't wasting their time actually collecting the data, but it's a very smart tool that brings all the information into one place for them. So instead of them handing out 30 pieces of paper, um, they can email out the form and all the data is is brought live in, into a, a spreadsheet within Google Docs, um, which means it, it spares their time up for the actual analysis, which is the important part. They don't mm. want to be naffing about with number crunching. And, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, that's not the bit that, that the research is based on. The, yeah. the research is based on the analysis of that data. So it's back to our working smarter, not harder, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, using the tools to cut down the time on collecting the stuff so that they've got real time to actually analyze the data. Mm. Will it do? I mean, will it do visualizations as well? Because I'm going back to this idea of oh, I might not well, do the 3D stuff, but well, that's do... the super smart thing about it as okay. well. Because normally you would take your questionnaire and plug all your data into an Excel spreadsheet, yep. and then you would have to tell Excel, do you want a pie chart or a bar chart? Well, Google Docs is really clever, and where appropriate, it will automatically put that data into into a visual aspect for you. So. If it, if it suits a pie chart, it will automatically do it for you, or if it suits a bar chart, etc. So, yeah, it, it's pretty sophisticated. Mm. Well, that's the thing, though, with a lot of students, if they're doing their dissertation, they might be really, really interested in their subject, but not particularly au fait with Excel. And yeah. so then their data might, their data analysis might fall down because they're not so good at making pie charts in Excel. Well, that's the beauty of Google Forms, using questionnaires right. there. Yes, because you're here to do a degree in... Exactly, you know, if it's psychology. Whatever, yeah. Is there any other technology or, or it could be hardware, could be software, could be a gadget or a gizmo that you couldn't do without that helps you with your role with it you know, what's what's the one thing that if we try to take it off you'd be like no it's mine ne- <laughs> nexus 7 that's it all right okay <laughs> yeah but that's that's quite a good portable device because it's it's just like a, an ipad but it's a lot smaller and it's cheaper which is another good thing and it's um it has a lot of functionality so you, you have your skype which, which is important in mm-hmm. a research point of view maybe not as a student but as a as a researcher how would you how, so with Skype then? I say like how how would a researcher use Skype? What's the or a it's, budding researcher use Skype? It's they use Skype in case they need to talk to the supervisor. But they're not right. In. Okay. Also, it's important when you're reading papers, you look at these authors who've written them, mm-hmm. and it's good to approach them and saying, "I'm a PhD student, for example. I'm doing this research. I read your paper." And I like this idea. Can you explain more about this method and methodology? Right. Okay. So what way of doing that? Say so you're going to travel to America and do it, which which is cost a fortune. And you could speak to them on video chat on Skype. Ah, that's that's mm. really good. And I always encourage PhD students to approach people. It's a good way of talking to people who are quite. You know, they're probably more professors, so they're yep. not using these you know fancy words with the case. It's good to approach them. It's all mm. good for proper networking. Gotcha. And networking is essential. If so, it's in your nickel group yeah. or outside, it's so, so important. Yeah. So, I mean, you mentioned, like, networking. I mean, do, does social networking have a role to play it, it can in do. supporting researchers or 
people making connections to work yes, collaboratively I, I, on I projects. So you, you've got your you LinkedIn, which is which is no important. Mm -hmm. um, you've got your Twitter. Mm -hmm. So if you if you want to um, have people's views on your internet views, you can tweet it out, as they say. Yeah. And you've got your Facebook. You've got, you can create groups. You can create uh, local areas where you can express ideas. So yes, the social networks is getting more and more popular. Everyone's yeah. using it. So people who are doing a PhD or, or even, even students who are mm -hmm. starting Newport, they all got, probably got a, a Facebook account. Gotcha. I think Newport does use Facebook, don't they, as a, mm -hmm. as a tool for It does, yeah. Well. We, we've got a, there's a Facebook group. I mean, how we've, we're trying it this year is um, we've got a Facebook group for every year. And it started this year. So the, that Facebook group is, is, belongs to the first years and it's got first year appropriate content on it. Then when those first years become second years next year, that Facebook page will have second year appropriate content on it and so on until it they goes graduate. With them. Yeah. And then behind them, so next year's first year intake will have their own distinctive Facebook page. So it's a bit like if you imagine like a sushi train. Mm -hmm. It's a bit like having the bowls of sushi. And each each Facebook page is a bowl that's going along and it belongs to that particular That makes group. much more sense though, because it used to be that the page would just be one page and then yeah. it would grow and grow and grow and you'd have all sorts of years in yeah. it and um, like um, you said you can't control the content no. to be but appropriate the, the great thing about this is though is that you know after the three years the students are here they can essentially keep that and it can become an alumni page yeah, um, yeah. and a networking page and so on and so forth so it doesn't have to like you say it doesn't have mm. to become a jumbled mess of content mm. it can be something that's always specific to that group no matter kind of what stage in their education or, or their career they're in you know, everyone else is kind of in the same boat who's still attached to that yeah. page and can can refer to something which is which is relevant to the area that uh, sorry to the kind of you know the stage that they're in in their in their life so that's, that's actually a, a really nice idea mm -hmm. and i just wanted to ask about linkedin as well um if i can do because you just mentioned linkedin very briefly and i think for somebody certainly for people who are in, in academia or or are sort of in in a particular in their career stage rather than necess not necessarily so much for students although it is still suitable but certainly for people um in academia or in careers linkedin's a really useful social networking tool and i wonder how you know how you would would use that and whether you recommend people join well essentially whether you recommend people would join linkedin is, is it a suitable tool for people to use it's it's facebook without the games and kind yeah. of nonsense that goes with it essentially <laughs> i think isn't it it's not posting your photos of ibiza yeah. holiday and what you get up to it's it's you know be, being able to pull those networks of people together and share experiences and ideas and research and, and kind of all the stuff that you wouldn't yeah. necessarily use Facebook for. If you have a question you want to answer, for example, you can say, I got this question, this point of view or this statement and see what, what, what comments I, you have. I've connected f with far more people on LinkedIn that I don't know from other institutions. Please hang up and try again. Okay, so you, you mentioned, um, so your, your piece of technology that you couldn't do with that is your trusty tablet and it will do... Skype and LinkedIn and all these other things. Um, why why is it so important to you? What's what what's that one thing that makes it the the must have thing to have? It's it's very very portable. You've got a train. Cause when you do go to conferences, you can read your papers mm -hmm. on the tablet, which is really really good. You can surf the web, check your emails. Mm -hmm. um, but that's more general. But you, you like say so you got a LinkedIn, you got Facebook. So it, it's, it's it's really really very good. Um, kit really fantastic good. So yeah the main advantage is it's portable right. and it's light a lot lighter than a laptop mm -hmm. and it's um i advise any student to get one brilliant any type of tablet. brilliant i mean so i guess the the other question to ask is you know, you've mentioned uh using technology to, to connect with people if people wanted to connect with yourself if they want to kind of ask, get in touch with you are you on linkedin have you got a website how can people is there something we can put up on the blog that people can can um, get to you? Yes, I've got a lot of ways. You can okay. use the email or the mm -hmm. phone. Mm -hmm. you ha I've got LinkedIn. I've uh, got Facebook. I've got Twitter now. Okay. I've got my own um, web present. Brilliant. Which I explained to you roughly how that's important for research as well. Yeah. So, so you, you, you've got a website? Yes, I do. Fab. And what's, if, if people go onto the website, what, what, what will they, they see, see there? Yeah. They see a picture of me. Lovely. <laughs> and the papers are published. Wonderful. And the work I've done... Uh, my PhD to the present day. Brilliant. And I will have um, like a blog as well. Wonderful. Brilliant. So we'll we'll be sure to put a link up to uh, your website, mm -hmm. um, and then I, I take me if people go to the website, you can then put other communication yes. Yes. tools up there for them to get hold of you. Well, that's fantastic. Um, has anyone got anything else they'd like to 
ask our resident uh, research expert whilst we've got her in the studio. No, no, I, I feel like I've attended one of Anne's uh, training <laughs> sessions today, yeah. actually, and it's been extremely useful. Um, mm, yeah. You know, I've learned a hell of a lot just from sitting in the room listening mm. to this. So, uh, you know, definitely be taking a look at Anne's site and, uh, and, and kind of maybe dropping her an email or something and uh, getting some information. <laughs> but, um, but no, no, it's been a really useful session. So. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree. I would like to come to one of your sessions, actually. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, so, well, in that case, then, all that really remains for me to say is, uh, firstly, to Anne, thank you ever so much for coming in and speaking to us. We are very, very grateful. It's been really, really interesting. And uh, like the insights you've given and the, uh, particularly the, the tools and resources have been invaluable. Um, and hopefully people listening to this will have a go at some of the things that you've mentioned. It's been fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right, well, in that case then, we'll wrap up. Um, I will, well, it's basically goodbye from me. My name's Paul. Yeah, uh, it's Carl here saying, yeah, thanks very much for listening. Hope it's been really useful. And uh, I'll catch you again very soon. Yeah, bye from me, Lindsay. See you next week. Okay, bye-bye. Don't be so